Hi everyone, I'll be doing a video on declarative programming with SQL. First off, if you want to follow along with the examples, you can get SQLite from www.sqlite.org or use the online interpreter at cryptkin.github.io slash sql.js slash gui. Make sure you're using at least version 3.8.3 or else you can't use the with statement. I'm also using SQLite man as a graphical interface to SQLite which you can optionally get to. By the way, my examples are mostly based on fall 2014 CS61A material. Anyway, in an imperative programming language like Python, you write a list of instructions like call foo, then call bar, then add the results together, and the interpreter executes every one of those instructions. Today, we'll be doing something different, declarative programming. In a declarative programming language such as SQL, you, the programmer, don't specify how to do something, but rather what the end result should be. It's the interpreter's job to then figure out how to get the end result. For those of you who have worked with HTML, you've used a declarative language before. When you write an HTML page, you write things like where text should go, what sizes text should be, etc. But you don't write the display code the code to figure out what colors each pixel should be on the screen. That's the browser's job to do. So HTML is an example of a declarative language. You don't write out the steps for displaying a web page, just what that web page lo should look like at the end. There's not too much you can do in HTML computation-wise, but declarative languages can actually be much more powerful. In fact, as powerful as imperative languages. Today, we'll use SQL. SQL is a language for working with databases. We'll just be using a tiny subset of it. In our subset of SQL, there are two types of commands. Select, which creates a table, either from scratch or from an existing table, and create table, which gives tables a global name. The select command gives us a table with a single row. If we want more than one row in our table, we can use select to create several one-row tables and then use union to anneal them together. We can then give our table a name by wrapping it inside a create statement. Notice that this time the table isn't displayed, but rather it's stored as the table employees. So that's the gist of creating a table from scratch. We can also create tables from existing tables. Let's try this. What happened? We just got a new, unnamed table containing only the name and title columns of employees. Notice that this table still contains every row from the original employees table. There is a way to only select certain rows when creating a new table though, using the WHERE statement. So now we got the names and titles of the engineers who make more than $30,000. Make sure you learn exactly what this statement does. It goes through the employees table. For each row, it checks to see if the condition in the WHERE clause is satisfied. If the condition is satisfied, it includes the specified fields of that row in the output. With these skills, we can already answer some simple questions, like, what are the names of Ben Bitdiddle's direct reports? I'll give you several seconds to think about this question. All right. Well, we want to select the names, and the names of the employees are going to come from the employees table. Uh, and we only want the employees where the employee's supervisor is Ben Bitdiddle. As we can see, Alyssa P. Hacker, side defect, and... All right. How much does Tycoon make? So, we want 
the salary of the employees, we're going to get the info from the employees table, and we want the employees who are named Tycoon. There's only one of them. And SQL tells us that Tycoon makes two million. Which people supervise themselves, and what divisions are they from? So we want the name and the division of the employees where the name of the employee is also the name of the supervisor of the employee, i.e. the employee is their own supervisor. So we see that there's one self-supervising employee, Tycoon, who is in the administration division. So what we've talked about so far is good enough for trivial queries like those. Let's talk about joining tables now, which allows us to use more than one table and which allows us to answer more complex questions. First, let's create another table now with some meeting times. Now we have two tables. Let's join them together and see what we get. Note that star means every column. So what did we get? We got a new table in which every row is a combination of a row from employees and a row from meeting times. In fact, every such combination appears in this table. The process looks like this. The first row in the join table is the first row in the employees table joined with the first row in the meeting times table. The second row in the join table is the first row of the employees table joined with the second row of the meeting times table and so on and so forth until we get to the second row of the employees table and the first row of the meeting times table and then the second row of the employees table and the second row of the meeting times table and so on and so forth. We eventually get every combination of rows and employees and meeting times in there. Notice that there's two division columns in this table. One of them came from the employees table and another came from the meeting times table. We can reference them as employees.division and meeting times.division respectively. That being said, often not every one of these rows is useful. Let's say we want to have a table with employee names and their meeting times. Let's take a look at what the join of employees and meeting times gave us. In the table, there's four different meeting times for Alyssa P. Hacker, but only one of them is correct. Which one is it? If we look at the original two tables, we see that Alyssa is in the engineering division, and the engineering division meets on Mondays. So now we see what the requirement is. The division of the employee should be the division we're using in the meeting times table. What we want is select name, comma, time from employees, comma, meeting times, where employees.division equals meeting times.division. What this statement says is, join the table's employees and meeting times, and then only keep the rows where the entry in the division column from the employees table matches the entry in the division column from the meeting times table. From that, keep the name and time columns and output the final table. Now, can you find the names and divisions of employees who have a meeting at Monday, 11 a.m.? So we want the name and division of the employees. And since both tables contain a column named division, we'll have to choose one of them. We'll choose the one in employees. The table we're getting data from is the join of employees and meeting times. Now, we only want to keep rows where the division field from the employees table matches up with the division field from the meeting times table. And we only want rows where the meeting time is Monday, 11 a.m. And there's the answer. As we can see, Tycoon and all the engineers have meetings at 11 a.m. on Mondays. It's even possible to join a table with itself. This lets us answer more complex questions like, which employees are middle managers, that is, they supervise others and are also supervised by a different person? Well, we want everyone who is somebody's supervisor and who isn't their own supervisor. We could try to write this out without a join, but we get stuck when we try to translate this into real SQL because select only operates on one row at a time. But what if we join employees with itself? 
we get a table with every permutation of two rows and employees, including identical rows. So that means if we use employees, comma employees, instead of employees in the from statement, we'll be able to write it out. One last issue remains. Right now, SQL doesn't have a way to distinguish between the first copy of the employees table and the second copy of the employees table because they both have the same name. We can create aliases for the two copies of the employees table, however. Here, we've given the first copy of the employees table the alias A, and we've given the second copy of the employees table the alias B. Then, we ask for all combinations of rows from A and B, where the name in the row from A is the same as the supervisor in the row from B, and where the row from A doesn't contain the same values for name and supervisor. For each join row, which satisfies those conditions, we print out the name from the row from A, which is also the supervisor from the row from B. Well, that was long. Let's see now if you can find employees whose supervisors make twice or more as much as them. Give the employee's name and salary and the supervisor's name and salary. You can pause the video here and resume it when you want to hear my answer. Well, we're going to work with two rows at a time, one for the employee and one for the supervisor. In our result table, we want the name of the employee, the salary of the employee, the name of the supervisor, and the salary of the supervisor. The first row is going to come from one copy of the employee's table, which we'll call employee, and the second row is going to come from another copy of the employee's table, which we'll call supervisor. Now, remember that employee and supervisor are just labels right now. We have to make sure that these labels really live up to their descriptions. So that means we have to make sure that the employee supervisor is the same as the supervisor's name. Also, we're only interested in employee supervisor pairs where the supervisor makes at least twice as much as the employee. So the answer is select employee.name, employee.salary, supervisor.name, supervisor.salary from employees as employee, employees as supervisor, where employee.supervisor equals supervisor.name and supervisor.salary is greater than or equal to two times employee.salary. If we actually run it, we see that Eben Scrooge, Tycoon, and Ben Bitbiddle are the supervisors who make at least twice as much as one of their employees. How about the names and meeting times of the employees who have a meeting at the same time as their supervisor? I'll let you pause the video right now, go work on the problem, and you can resume it when you've found an answer or want to see how I did it. Here's one way to do the problem. We need to find all of the employee supervisor pairs, and then for each of those pairs, we need to find what the employee's meeting time is, what the supervisor's meeting time is, and see if those two meeting times are the same. So we can go through each combination of four rows, two from the employees table and two from the meeting times table, and make the first row the row for the employee in the employees table, the second row the row for the supervisor in the employees table, the third row the row for the employees division in the meeting times table, and the fourth row the row for the supervisor's division in the meeting times table. In order to do that, we need to make sure that the following conditions are true. First, the employee's supervisor has to be the supervisor's name. Second, the division in the first row and the third row should be the same. Third, the division in the second row and the fourth row should be the same. And fourth, the meeting times in the third row and the fourth row are the same. There's another, perhaps more easily understandable, way to do the last problem. What made our solution so complicated was the fact that in order to find an employee's meeting time, we had to first find their division and then use that to find their meeting time. But if we had a single table with employees and their meeting times in the same row, then our job would be a lot easier. All we'd have to do is join that table to itself and then compare employees' and supervisors' meeting times to see if they were equal. The code would look very similar to the code we used a while back to find which employees were in the same division as their supervisors. 
But at the same time, we don't want to make a new global employees and meeting times table just for this one problem. Fortunately, there is a way to temporarily give a table a name using the with statement. Here's how we'd solve the problem using the with statement. What this does is it creates a temporary table called employees and meeting times with columns name, supervisor, and meeting time, which contains all of the employees, their supervisors, and their meeting times. Then it runs the select statement underneath, which is the code I showed earlier. After the select statement finishes, the temporary table goes away. So cool, we can write more straightforward queries using the with statement. But there's more. One of the most important things about with is that it allows us to do recursion. Let's try this problem. Make a table of the even numbers from 0 to 14 inclusive. Well, we notice that 0 is in the table, and if n is in the table and n is less than 14, then n plus 2 will also be in the table. So here's how we'd write that in SQL. This is an example of a recursive with statement. The definition of evens relies on evens. How does the interpreter interpret that? It first starts with the select zero statement, which gives us a table with one row containing a single zero. It binds this table to evens, and then runs the next statement, select n plus 2 from evens, where n is less than 14. This gives us another table with a single row containing a 2. It now binds that table to evens, and then repeats the process. Every time, it gets another new table with a single row containing the next even number until it reaches 14. After that, the condition n is less than 14 fails, so it doesn't get any more new rows. The interpreter then unions together all of the one row tables it created and binds the final result to evens. All right, now can you find the Fibonacci numbers up to the 15th one? Here's a hint, you can't join a local table with itself, so use more than one column. Well, our Fibonacci table, we're going to use two columns here, A and B, where A and B are consecutive numbers in the sequence. And we'll add another column n to keep track of which number in the sequence we're in. So this table is going to start with 0 and 1. And since 0 is the 0th number of the Fibonacci sequence, n will start at 0. Now, the next row is going to be b and a plus b, where b and a were b and a from the last row. And n plus 1 is going to be the new count. And we're going to get those numbers from the previous row in fib. And we, we want to go up to n equals 15. So we'll say n's less than 15. And finally, with this bigger Fibonacci table defined, we can select n and a from the Fibonacci table to get just the indices and the numbers. OK, now let's try another problem. Find all of the superiors of all of the employees. A superior is an employee supervisor, or the supervisor supervisor, or the supervisor supervisor supervisor. You get the point. You can pause the video here and resume it when you want to hear my answer. Notice two things about a superior. An employee supervisor is a superior of that employee. And the supervisor's superiors are also superiors of that employee. This recursive definition is enough for us to solve the problem. We'll create a superiors table in which each row has an employee's name and a name of a superior of that employee. So how are we going to fill up our superiors table? Well, for a base case, we can start with the stuff in the employees table. The employees table contains employees and their supervisors, and a supervisor is a superior of an employee. So we can just copy and paste that stuff from the employees table. Now time for the recursive case. Here, for each superior we currently have, we're going to find out that superior's supervisor and add in a new row containing the employee's name and that new superior's name 
and we're going to keep repeating this until there are no more superiors to add. So our code's going to look like this. If we run it, we're going to get this output. We can sort the output by superior in order to make verifying it easier. We're just going to add an order by clause at the end of the select statement. And as we can see, Alyssa P. Hacker is Lewis Reasoner's superior, Ben Bitdiddle is the superior of all the people below him, including Lewis Reasoner, and Tycoon is everyone's superior, and so on. So that's basic declarative programming in SQL. There's a lot more to SQL that I didn't cover, which you can learn if you're interested. I hope you found these examples helpful.